in my program, the importance of the early pre-classic trade routes over land, river, and sea, cacao, jade, maize, ceramics, genetics, language, and calendars with your host, Jim Reed. And I am an independent researcher. I am not a knower. I share the research of others. And I represent the Atslander, the Institute of Maya Studies, and the Maya Conservancy. So this uh, slide I always like to start off with. This is the morning of December 21st, 2012. And I am at Puerto San Jose on the Guatemalan Pacific Coast. I'm wearing a surfer shirt that my friend on the Guatemalan surfing team gave me. And what's interesting about this is <clears throat> I had been invited down by Mary Lou Ridinger and the Guatemalan uh, Institute of uh, Tourism and Sports to attend a symposium in 2010 to tell the site guys and tourism officials what to expect, what do we know about the Mayan calendars, and what could they do to answer the questions of the thousands of people that they were expecting to go to Guatemala to experience the end of the world. And I told them, well, it's not the end of the world. And <clears throat> later on, at a dinner, a tourism official was taking notes on a napkin sitting next to me. And he asked me, well, where, where should we send the people to go to do, to be with a Maya elder doing a ceremony? And I said, take them to the beach. And then they said, what, not to Cal? I go, no. I go, the angle of the Guatemalan Pacific coast is such that the sun rises over the ocean. And to take them to the ocean to be bathed in the new golden light, the new morning sunlight. And uh, they didn't heed my advice. They took the people to Tikal. And it, says, it turns out the, uh, the morning was all clouded over, no bright sunlight. What sun there was was blocked by the jungle trees and the pyramids. And so be it. They didn't heed my advice. But here I am with my friends in the golden sunlight on the most important morning of this era. So I honor the ancient sea merchants who traveled back and forth from the Ecuadorian Pacific coast to South America, following the turtles to the El Salvadorian, Guatemalan, and Soconosco coasts of Mesoamerica. I honor the ancient land merchants who traded products and shared the new and evolving ideas about their spiritual and ceremonial relationship to the land and all its varied inhabitants, along with those who studied the skies above them. And I honor the Olmec and Maya royalty who spurred on this whole cultural evolution with their desires to consume the best of cow and wear the most precious jade. And I dedicate this to Mary Lou Ridinger. Here she is under the Saiba tree on her land at Izapa. We'll be talking more about Izapa later, but you may know Mary Lou together with her husband, Jay Ridinger. They were the ones who rediscovered the ancient jadeite mines of the Maya. And she's an expert in jade. In fact, when the archeologists find jade in their excavations, they can send samples to Mary Lou and she can tell them exactly which mine it came from. That's amazing. If you're ever in Antigua, Guatemala, visit her storefront and workshop, Jade Maya. So I have a lot of acknowledgements. I wanna thank Mary Lou Ridinger, George W. Lovell, Nicholas Hopkins, David Bowles, who's with us tonight, 
Mary Pohl, who's with us tonight, Rosemary Joyce, Jonas Henderson, Joe Gunn, who's with us today, Carla Wan, who's with us, uh, Nicholas Helmer, Michael Grove, Soaring Bear, who is with us tonight, Lorraine Williams Beck, Richard Terry, Jaime Awe, who's with us tonight, Richard L. Thornton, and Douglas T. Peck. Thank you all for helping me and whatever research you've done or whatever leads you've given me, you've helped me to put this presentation together. And I want to thank all of you for attending and supporting me with my new presentation. Let's start off with an image from a paper that Joel Gunn was a co-writer on and the emergence of the complex societies after the sea levels stabilized. Sea level rose rapidly from the last glacial maximum approximately 18,000 years ago until it stabilized about 7,000 years ago. Sea level stabilization contributed significantly to the rapid advent of civilizations. And evidence from regions around the world show that societies with class distinctions first emerged near coastal margins. And here's a map I put together from satellite photography of the early archaic period, back when there were just hunters and gatherers around 14,000 to 9,000 BCE. And there have been some human remains found off the coast of Cancun and the Maya Riviera that go back 14,000, 13,000 years ago. <clears throat> and that was at a time before the sea levels rose. So these individuals, uh, one of them was a woman, was interred way back in the back of a cave that was then dry. But as the sea levels rose, they're now They've now found them uh, in the other underwater cave system, especially off of Tulum. Some of the original land trade was in flint and obsidian. And this shows one of the main, the main trade route that first emerged on the land. And it's coming down from the Gulf Coast of Mexico, the highlands of Mexico, the Pacific Coast of Mexico, from the Gulf Coast Olmec area across the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, and then totally down the Pacific Coast, all the way to Panama and Costa Rica and, and into uh, Colombia and South America. This was about uh, 10,000 years to 3,000 years ago. And it's when first village life first appeared along the Pacific coast from 4,200 to 3,300 years ago. What were the, uh, an early trade item <clears throat> along the Pacific coast was the spiny oyster or the spondylus shell for its beautiful color and the fact that the spines when opened, it made a little cup, like an offering place. And its distribution was along the Pacific coast of Ecuador and the Pacific coast of West Mexico. And <clears throat> spandula shell and a jade bead it made a perfect offering fit for Maya Royal. And this image is courtesy of Sofia Paredes Mari of La Ruta Maya Foundation. And below, we see some round ear flares made of spondylus shell jade and turquoise. And they were traveling up the northern trade route all the way into the south and western part of the United States and all the way up to where Cheryl Norman is up in Utah to get the turquoise. Below right, we have two square ear flares made of spondylus shell. So here's another view of the trade routes as it advanced. And we see that the there was early Pacific trade coming up from the Pacific coast of Ecuador and Colombia. And they brought with them the uh, domesticated maize after it had moved from its homeland in 
southern Mexico. Uh, it was taken down to uh, South America, where it was further domesticated and then brought back up. And uh, they brought, they also brought up the first ceramics. And the Barra ceramic complex was uh, very early, around 1700 to 1500 before the common area. And Manioc was the original archaic period arrival from the south. Corn got near El Mirador around 2750 before the common area. And here's further expansion in Mesoamerica, uh, 1600 to 1400 BCE. We can see Tacalicabac there, Chapa de Corzo, we'll mention again. San Lorenzo is in the Olmec area. And we can see this trade route coming along the Gulf Coast, Gulf Caribbean coast, uh, up from the Colombian Gulf Coast. This map shows uh, the Olmec heartland and the pre-classic sites with Olmec influence. And you can see those sites are all along the Pacific trade route up into El Mirador. They follow the same original trade routes. And this is further extending the trade routes once they reached all over. Yucatan. Again, we can see this very important Caribbean Gulf Coast trade route. Where were they trading? Cacao, jade, salt, ceramics, cotton, honey, obsidian, skins, feathers, flint tools, and spondylus. And you can see grafted out where these various things were found. One interesting thing is that the Maya tribes controlled the precious green jadeite on the north side of the Motagua River, and other tribes on the south side of the river controlled the blue, blue green jade that the Olmecs preferred. And somehow they were able to get all the way up and around to the Olmec area without the Mayans uh, finding too much about it. We don't have blue-green jade in any of these coastal areas so far in excavations, but we do have it coming back down. And I'll show you later, Takalikaok, blue-green jade that was traded down from the Olmec area it came this direction. But I believe there's some of these uh, ports or islands, Isla Cotoy, Isla Mujeres, Isla Cozumal, uh, the uh, island of uh, Haina, and there's other islands. I think that the those who brought the blue-green jade were staying on the outer side of islands, away from the coastal Maya. So let's get into the domestication of maize, and thank you, Nicholas Helmuth, for this image of he went to the Guatemalan markets, and this is all the various colors of maize that he could find. And very early on, 10,000 years of domestication, Teosinte was transformed into maize. The new research says corn was domesticated from Teosinte 1,500 years earlier than formally documented probably domesticated in the Mexican tropical forests of Chiapas and Oaxaca. The earliest physical evidence for domesticated maize dates to at least 8,700 calendar years ago, and it was probably domesticated by indigenous peoples in the lowland areas of southwestern Mexico and not in the highland areas. Other evidence allowed researchers to trace the dispersal of maize as a domesticated crop from its origin in and around the Balsas Valley in Mexico, 
by 7,600 years ago, and shortly thereafter to Ecuador and Colombia, then on to Uruguay and by 4,600 years ago. Uh, at the time of getting down to Ecuador and Colombia, it came back up. And here you can see some of those intermediate uh, forms of corn. And this is uh, varieties of maize found near Cusco and Machu Picchu in the Inca Sacred Valley in Peru. And the tremendous differences in morphology between Teosinte and maize led Paul Mangelsdorf and his colleague Robert Reed Reeves in the late 1930s to propose a tripartite hypothesis. This hypothesis stated that maize was domesticated from a now extinct wild maize from South America. Teosinte originated from a cross between maize and another grass, Tripsico. And here's a graph that shows again some of these uh, intermediate stages of corn. The A version here shows a schematic comparing the conventional domestication model under which maize became fully domesticated and then dispersed throughout the Americas. Statistics demonstrating excess sharing between the Pan American lineage and wild Bariglumus compared with other maize, revealing a non uniform crop wild gene flow after initial domestication. The red down in C uh, shows the Mexican Teosinte mixed with the blue South American maize. Very, very interesting. So another view of this interaction between the North and the South. Uh, in this study, a single domestication for maize shown by multiculous microsatellite geotyping um, their analyses indicate that the oldest surviving maize types are those of the Balsas River Valley and the Mexican highlands, with maize spreading from this region over the Americas along two major paths. One passes through western and northern Mexico into the southwestern United States, and then into the eastern uh, U.S. and up into Canada. And the other one, second path, leads out of the highlands. Uh, to the western and southern lowlands of Mexico into Guatemala and the Caribbean islands and the lowlands of South America and finally the Andes Mountains. And the two areas I want to focus on of uh, river trade, um, this is western maritime trade from western Ecuador to the Soconusco coast of Mexico. Here's a little detail of this area of Ecuador. And first postulated by Vincent Maustrom, there's turtles that migrate from down here to over here to lay their eggs. And the ancient seafarers <clears throat> could have uh, followed the turtles um, along with celestial navigation. It's, it's a direct route we're cutting across here. And by taking the direct route, they could stay away from the coastlines and the other tribes who might have seen them passing and, and gone out to uh, plunder or give them problems or want some of the maize or whatever. We'll see later how the maize went back up from down here, went back up here, and it took us a lot, a, hundreds of years more to get back down to Panama and Costa Rica. It didn't go directly. This new, the newest final version didn't go directly here. So they were able to circumnavigate all of the tribes living along the coast here by following the turtles. And here's another detail of that uh, area. And we'll see Valdivia has its own type of ceramics that was traded north. <clears throat> and uh, the name of this paper is Directly Dated Starch Residues 
document early formative maize in tropical Ecuador. The study of maize domestication has advanced from questions of its own origins to the study and debate of its dietary role in the timing of its dispersal from Mexico. Employing a new technique to recover starch granules from charred cooking pot residues, this study showed that maize was present, cultivated, and consumed here in domestic contexts by at least 5,300 to 4,950 before present. And uh, thanks to W. George Lovell and his book, Death in the Snow, that uh, we covered in the June 23 at Slander. Here you see a one-masted indigenous raft being loaded with goods prior to embarking on long distance commerce along the Pacific coast. And this is courtesy of the Museo Nacional de Ecuador. But I want you to look closely at, at what they're loading onto this vessel. And that is, uh, looks like seed corn. And here is a bunch of different styles of ceramics. Um, and the Ecuadorians were very influential in uh, jump-starting the use of ceramics along the Soconosco and Guatemalan coasts. So early chronology of Western Ecuador, we see in the Archaic period, 4,800 to 4,000 BCE, it was uh, the ending of the hunter-gatherer period and maize was present as early as 6,000. BCE. In the early formative period from 4400 to 3000 BCE, there was the beginning of small circular hammocks with small populations and the first uh, appearance of the Valdivia ceramics around 3500 to 3000 BCE. From 3000 to 24 BCE, uh, centers grew in size and they were centered around rectangular plazas with larger populations, more people and public buildings. 2400 to 1800 BCE, there were satellite hamlets, hamlets around these inland, around the centers. And from 1800 to 1450 BCE, there were big regional centers in the inland valleys. Moving on to the middle formative, maize was dry before processing. And 1400 to 850 BCE, there was an expansion of agriculture and the machila, machilia ceramics. Later on in the late formative, before the pre-classic, uh, after 850 BCE, we have the chorrera ceramics. So here's an interesting chart and look at some of these dates. Uh, this is in Mexico and uh, in this study, maize is considered the most important native crop of the Americas. Several lines of evidence indicate that the Mesoamerican village lifestyle began with maize domestication. Originating in the Mexican southwestern area, maize journeyed southwards, traveling hand in hand with pottery and bringing sed sedentary life to the Andes. But these uh, dates up here, 8,240 years before present in the Oaxaca area. A uh, little later on in the Olmec area around Tabasco. Later on, it moved up into um, the, the highlands of Mexico, around where Mexico City is here today. Uh, later on, uh, further inland in Guatemala, the lowlands of Guatemala. Um, also, Veracruz in the Olmec area, that's coming down towards the Maya era, area. And see, this is what I was talking about. It didn't get to Costa Rica and Panama till later. So that's very interesting to me. And if uh, you'll see in this program, I have a slight focus on the Maya. The Maya have my heart. And here's a, uh, a graph showing the evolution of domesticated maize through the Maya uh, through time. And this is um, how many years before present, 
So the Zapotec, which were over in the Oaxaca, and where where corn was originally uh, domesticated, and then in Chiapas, right there with the Soconusco Coast, it took a almost two thousand years to get down into the Maya area, uh, and further down another thousand years to get to the Cachiquels and Quiche in the highlands. So this again is very interesting. Genetic, archaeological, botanical, and paleoecological data furnished evidence that maize had a single domestication origin from the wild grass teosinte in the Rio Balsas region of southwestern Mexico, approximately 63,000 to 10,000 calendar years before present. And pollen samples in this study were taken from sediments in lakes, swamps, and archaeological deposits. And over time, it spread to the Maya area. So let's talk about some language studies, where it started from over there and ended up over here. <laughs> and this is from Nicholas Hopkins and his great radical proposal. Uh, but look at all the language isolates along the Pacific coast that we're talking about. Um, here is the Soconosco area going down into Guatemala, El Salvador. Um, and we're going to concentrate mostly on the uh, Michi and Zoke language. Um, Totonacan is in the Olmec area. And these are all the distributions of the languages right before uh, European contact. So Nicholas' hypothesis is the isolates, along with Mihe Sokean, and perhaps Tonokan are the remnants of long distance trade route. So the chronology of the Soconosco and Mihe Soke. 1900 BCE, there's a southern, sudden intrusion of the Mokaya people. Their name translates to the people of corn with elite ceramics and maize agriculture. The Barafe ceramics, 1900 to 1700, and I'll show you later a, a Barafe type ceramic bowl, which is some of the first evidence of cacao. And the Lacona, Lacona phase, 1700 to 1500 BCE, and the pre proto mehe sokean language. 1500 to 1400 BCE, you have the Ocos phase ceramics there along the uh, Guatemalan Pacific coast. And they were speaking a proto mehe soke. 1500 to 1000, the agricultural villages started up via migration to the Gulf across the Isthmus of Tuatepec, and the Olmec cultures on the Gulf were speaking Proto Sakayan. Izapa on the Pacific was Proto Mejian. So there was the language was splitting up, and different groups were going to different areas. 1300 BCE, back influence from the Olmecs on the Pacific coast. And uh, Pasado de la Mata, I'll also show you that that has one of the earliest archaeological evidence of, of cacao uh, from a ceramic vessel and parallel presidents of Mejians on the Gulf uh, around Oaxaca and the Gulf Mejian was spoken. Later in the pre-classic 400 to 250 CE, you had the influence of Teotihuacan and uh, that peaks early and in the early classic and then in ends about 700 CE with the demise of Teotihuacan. And uh, Nicholas Hopkins believes that Mehesokein, a northern version, which is now extinct, was spoken at Teotihuacan. So here's a close-up of some of those main language isolates. And the Mehesokein languages of southern Mexico and Guatemala. And from there, languages spread in different regions. And these Maya languages will show up in just a second. 
So here is the spread along the same Pacific trade route and up into the Highlands trade route that I mentioned of the Mahian and the Sokayan language groups. This here is the Olmec area, and this is the uh, Soconusco coast. And here we have the Izapa region. So you can see why they said earlier that Izapa was speaking a Mahian language. These are all places that show Olmec influence. And it turns out uh, from information in the current September Atslander from David Bowles in his article about Quetzalcoatl, he has this map that shows that the uh, the spread of the, of the Quetzalcoatl cult, if you want to call it that, was along the same northern Gulf Coast trade routes. Architectural, artistic, and ceramic links between a network of important centers in the Epic Classic were part of a new world order, melding religious and political messages intricately linked to a pan-Mesoamerican religious cult associated with the personage or deity Quetzalcoatl. The importance of religious syncretism and shared symbols in pan mesoamerican trade cartels linking the Maya area, Highland Mexico, and the Gulf Coast is well known. The spread of this cult likely originated in the Chontalpa region in the ninth century, with the strongest evidence of the participation occurring along the riverine waterways and the Gulf Coast. So here's a, uh, a vertical graph that shows the involvement of all of the Maya languages. And you can see the proto Huastecan. They left very early on where the, the, uh, the proto Maya language group first originated. They left there very early on and headed north of the Olmec area. <clears throat> and they held on to their language for a long, long time. Also, the Yucatecans were uh, left early and uh, their language also stayed very, very uh, true to itself for a couple thousand years. Here's a horizontal version of this map and you can see how the Proto-Mayan uh, branched off into the different areas and here's some, here's Kachkel, Tutsui, Kiche, uh, all of the one Maya languages that you may be more familiar with. And you can see again how the Yucatarian, Yucatecan branch kept for 2,000 years. It stayed pretty much the same uh, along with the Huastecan branch. Pretty much the same for 2,000 years. So Mitzi Lynn is asking, well, where did the Proto Mayans start from? And that's right here in the uh, Chuchumatanes area of, of Chiapas and Guatemala. And the earliest proposal which identified the Chiapas Guatemalan highlands as the likely cradle of Mayan language was published by the German antiquarian and scholar Carl Sapper in 1912. Since then, Terence Kaufman and John Justison have uh, reconstructed more than 3,000 lexical items for Proto-Mayan language. Approximate migration routes and dates for various Mayan language families. The region shown as Proto-Mayan is now occupied by speakers of the Canchubalan branch of Mayan languages, who are the descendants of a Proto-language called Proto-Maya or in Kichemaya, Nabimaya, the old Maya language. The Proto-Mayan language is believed to have been spoken in the Chuchumatanes hang highlands of central Guatemala. Speakers of the Western branch moved south and into the areas now inhabited by Mamian and Kichean people when speakers of the Proto-Tetzladian later separated 
from the Cholan group and moved south to the Chiapas Highlands. They came into contact with speakers of that Mihesokean language. In the archaic period before 2000 BCE, a number of loan words from Mihesokean languages seem to have entered the Proto-Mayan language. This had led to the hypothesis that the early Maya were dominated by speakers of the Mihesokean languages, possibly the Olmec. And in the case of the Zincan and Lincoln languages, on the other hand, Mayan languages are more often the source than the receiver of loan words. So let's move on to some comparative ceramics. A lot of this is from Nicholas Hopkins. Here's that Barafe ceramic bowl I mentioned where the earliest, oldest evidence of Mesoamerican cacao, cacao was found in this vessel. And look how some of these shapes look exactly like what the one masted vessel from Ecuador uh, that they were loading onto the raft, the balsa raft looks like. And notice the sheen, the patin and, and the slanted eyes. These are from uh, the Manabi province in Ecuador. And this same sheen occurs in ceramics in Western Mexico. But first we see these stirrup vessels from uh, Tatilco in uh, Central Mexico compared with an Ecuadorian version from uh, Chorera. So here's that same sheen in this Colima figurine from Mexico. And we see the same style in the Chorera whistling vessel. Comparing houses, here's a Nayarit house north of the Soconusco area. Uh, it's Lam del Rio and Nayarit, and it's compared with an Ecuadorian house from Chorea. So a lot of ceramic production going on in Chorea. Uh, again, this beautiful sheen. Here's Colima, this side Ecuador, and you notice these these tusk like features on their necklaces, and they found out that these are from the cochero whale tusks that are, these are excavated uh, in, uh, in sites in Panama, but yet they noticed the holes to put them on a necklace. But this was a style in both Ecuador and in Southwestern Mexico. So let's talk about the dogs. Here's uh, some famous dancing dogs from Colima. And here's a nice little cute puppy uh, from Ecuador. And Nicholas uh, Hopkins also has a sense of humor. And he goes, this is what dogs were good for. And it looks like the guy has been roasted and he's on his plate ready for consumption. There were also wheeled deer that have been found. And these famous wheeled dogs from Chihuatan, Ecuador. And Mitzi Lin is saying, well, what about the evolution of wheeled dogs? Well, Mitzi, this is the evolution of wheeled dogs moving right up into the, today's modern world. <laughs> Another item that was traded uh, with common styles in the north and south. In the top, we have a copper alloy axe. And uh, on the bottom from Guerrero, uh, Mexico. Another interesting tie-in is the painted J or Dicky J. And its only, only distribution is in South America and a small area, area in West Mexico. The same two areas we were talking about with maize, ceramics, and cacao. And all of this has been uh, due to the work of Nicholas Hopkins. And in a personal, personal communication, he shared with me two of his PowerPoint presentations that he used uh, for his talk for the American Anthropological Association in San Francisco. And his paper was The Radical Proposal, 
the pre proto Mehian, Sokean, and language isolates along the Mesoamerican Pacific coast. Thank you, Nick. So let's talk about some genetic studies. Uh, this is an interesting graph uh, graphic. It's a map showing the population structure of the Caribbean and neighboring populations. The areas in red indicate countries of origin of newly geotyped admixed population samples, and the blue circles indicate new Venezuelan uh, and other previously published Native American samples. So, from a paper named Reconstructing the Population Genetic History of the Caribbean, we find this study finds their cluster based analysis revealed that native Venezuelan components do share membership with several Central American indigenous populations, such as the Costa Rican Cabezar, with Maya groups from Guatemala and the Yucatan Peninsula suggesting substantial gene flow across the Caribbean Sea in pre-Columbian times. Uh, here's another interesting graph chart map from a paper called Reconstructing the Population Genetic History of the Caribbean. It's a map showing the major indigenous components shared across the Caribbean basis namely the Mesoamerican in the blue, the Chibchang in the yellow, and South American in the green. And you can see that the green ends up in the Maya area, as does the yellow, and the blue ends up in South America. So there was a big gene mixture happening in this whole area. And their results demonstrate that such long distance negotiations were accompanied by genetic exchange between previously diverged populations and give new insight into the dynamics between the inhabitants of the Caribbean basin. Okay, in a paper titled The Origin of Mayans According to the HLA Genes and the Uniqueness of Amerindians, posted on ResearchGate by co-writer uh, co Eduardo Gomez Casado, his study says the genetic distances between the Maya and other populations show that the Maya are both close to Mesoamericans and South Americans. Awako and the Colombian Chicham, Chicham family show the closest genetic distance to the Maya, followed by the Mixteco, Mexico, and the Otomanguean family, Mexican Mestizo, the Kogi in Colombia and Chibchan family, the Seri in Mexico with the Hokono Huitlaca family, the Mazatecans and Zapotecos in Mexico with the Otomanguean family, the Wayu Colombia Macro Arawak family, Eastern Toba from Brazil, Arsario in Colombia, the Malayo family, the Mise in Mexico and Mise Zoke family, and the Cayapa, Ecuador, Barbacoan family. The Maya studied in the present paper come from Shela, Shelahu, Catatanengo, Guatemala, in the southern area, and their closest genetic relatives are tribes living nowadays in the Caribbean area of Colombia, as in the uh, Arawak, the Kogi, and the Arsario. Thus, it may be postulated that the Maya are an Atuk. Cronolis population related to the first recorded Caribbean inhabitants, the Arawak, and whose close culture flourished between 1500 BCE and 1500 CE by not fully explained reasons. And this is a very, very recent study. Uh, released and sent to me, uh, released in nature.com. And it's also on uh, ancientorigins.com and was uh, sent to me by Carla Juan, who's tuning in tonight uh, from Cayo Belize. And the name of this study is The Maya Were Likely Taught to Grow Corn by Southern Migrants. A team of archaeologists and genetic scientists have announced the results of a groundbreaking study of DNA 
obtained from ancient migrant skeletons found in Belize. The study also shows specific evidence for the migration of corn cultivation from South America that these migrants from South apparently brought with them. In their article in the journal Nature Communications, the researcher explained how their genetic tests revealed the existence of a previously unknown group of migrants in Central America who arrived in the Maya lands in large numbers starting approximately 5,600 years ago. And Jaime Awe says the impact of these newcomers cannot be overstated. They were the first pioneers who essentially planted the seeds of Maya civilization. And Jaime was with us here tonight. This paper uh, is titled South to North Migration Preceded the Advent of Intensive Farming in the Maya Region. And we report genome-wide ancient DNA data from a transect of 20 individuals from two Belize rock shelters dating between 9,600 and 3,700 calibrated radiocarbon years before present. The oldest individuals, the 9,600 to 3,000 before present, descended from the early Holocene Native American lineage with only distant relatedness to present-day Mesoamericans including the Mayan-speaking populations. After 5600 before present, a previously unknown human dispersal from the South made a major demographic impact on the region, contributing more than 50% of the ancestry of all later individuals. This new ancestry arrived from a source related to present-day Chibchan speakers living in uh, Costa Rica and Colombia, and its arrival corresponds to the first clear evidence of forest clearing and maize horticulture in what became the Maya region. So this is a recent DNA analysis, um, courtesy of David Bowles, and he had the DNA tested of his assistant, Antonio Putsu. And, uh, they were expecting a lot more Asian and Maya. But what showed up in the recent ancestry genealogy is an admixed American of uh, Mexican, 51.2%, and Peruvian, 21.5%. Pure indigenous peoples of the America, 12.3%, and Colombian, 11.1%. So David is wondering where the heck did the Peruvian and the Colombian come from? If you read the genetic study, you'll see they say about the Peruvian aspect that this genotype is represented throughout people in closely neighboring geographical regions such as Ecuador, Argentina, uh, Mestizo, Armada, Bolivia, Chile, the Quechua, and the Inca. Peru has a rich history that goes back at least 13,000 years. And while it has always been vastly diverse with several indigenous cultures that still haven't been contacted by global civilization even today, Peru is also home to some of the most successful civilizations in human history. The Norte Chico civilization arose around 3500 BCE, making it one of the oldest known civilizations in the world. This civilization spanned 30 cities and thrived around the Fortaleza, Pautivilca, Supe, and Huara rivers until its decline around 1800 BCE. Reading the genetic study, when it mentions Colombia, they say this genotype is represented throughout people in closely neighboring geographical regions, such as Venezuela, again Ecuador, the Wayu, Pastu, Zinu, Panama, Mestizo, País, and Embera. Colombia is an ethnically and linguistically diverse place. Its inhabitants feature a mix of different genetics that have passed through the region. Archaeological evidence indicates that the first humans in Colombia appeared around 17,000 years ago. And Colombia is also one of the most biodiverse countries on the planet. So, David decided to have his wife 
Leonore, can you, uh, her genetic tests, and they were expecting half Asian and half Maya, um, but what showed up was, yes, uh, a lot percent of East Asian, more than Maya, but uh, the admixed American was Peruvian and Mexican, 29% Peruvian. And of the Mexican, this genotype is represented throughout people in closely neighborhood geographical regions such as Mestizo, Nahual, Aztec, Maya, Zapotec, Miztec, Otomi, Totonac, Cachiquel, and Man. Mexico has been both genetically and culturally diverse for thousands of years, even before the arrival of the Spanish. The geography of Mexico isolated many indigenous populations that allowed them to develop distinct genetic differences as well as cultural ones. Many people are familiar with the Aztec and Maya civilizations, but there are still 68 different indigenous cultures in Mexico today, each with a distinct language. Some of the people from these cultures are as genetically different from each other as Europeans are from East Asians. <clears throat> so this is an interesting study, a genetic study of uh, the population of genetics of the Polynesian islands. And in a paper called the Native American Gene Flow into Polynesia predating the Easter Island Rapa Nui settlement, the origin and spread of early Native American ancestry in Polynesia. <clears throat> and I think it's interesting to look here. We have very early on, 1150 of the common era, um, coming in from the uh, Mixe and the Zapotec, the uh, Soconosco region. So they were traveling west over to the uh, Pacific Islands, Polynesian Islands. <clears throat> and our localization of the Native American ancestry found in Polynesia is consistent with several linguistic, historical, and geographic observations that support an origin in Northern South America. That's right here in the Peruvian region. Our earliest estimated date of contact is 1150 CE, for Fato Hiva in the South Marquesas, that's here. So these it, tribes were coming over from this area. Uh, uh, later on, a year, a century and a half later, they were coming more from uh, the central Bolivia area, southern Peru, and then way later on, 1860 is a common area from further down in South America. So it is to the north of Peru uh, that the Pacific coast changes from desert to forest, suitable for boat construction. And it is from the Pacific Ecuador, Colombia, uh, that Native American voyagers are believed to have embarked for trade with Mesoamerica in large ocean-going sailing rafts made of balsa wood dating to the period of 600 CE to 1200 CE. And here we have Thor Heidethal's uh, Ratu boat made of reeds. Um, the late Norwegian adventurers decided to try to prove that human migration between continents was possible. And he recounted all this in the book Kantiki. And the Ratu was made by this man climbing the ladder, Dimitrio Limachi from Bolivia. And here is a, another stirrup vase uh, with a canoer in a reed boat. And how were they able to do this? They were going on the currents. So the currents from the Soconusco area, we're going straight across. The currents from the Ecuadorian area, we're going straight across. Uh, these later on southern areas, they, they went up, 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 and over. 
what's interesting too is that a lot of them who traveled to Polynesia, they didn't come back. They went there to uh, to uh, spread their genes, let's say. <laughs> um, so this is from the paper, Native American Gene Flow into Polynesia, Predating Easter Island Settlement. And wind and current simulations from the Pacific coast of the Americas have demonstrated that drift voyages departing from Ecuador and Colombia are the most likely to reach Polynesia. And they arrive with the highest probability in the South Marquesas Islands, followed by the Tuamoto Archipelago. And in both, they have found a Colombian Native American component. In Thor Heidethal's famous drift voyage from Peru to Polynesia, his con Tiki raft had to be towed 80 miles offshore from Peru because the southern current, this one here, uh, along the Peruvian coast was so unfavorable. Once in the trans-Pacific currents, the Contiki rafted land raft landed in the Tuamoto Archipelago. All right. So let's take a look at canoes, rafts, and maritime vessels, and the tribes who control the trade. Here we have uh, from the Maya, the stingray god on the left, and the jaguar god paddle a canoe as depicted on incised bones from burial 116 in Temple 1 at Tikal. And please note the shape of the paddles. Uh, here we have two gods fishing from a canoe, and the sheer straight and overhanging end platforms are less ceremonial and more appropriate of a work boat. From an incised bone again from Burial 116 in Temple 1 at Tikal, we have the paddler gods and animal deities vigorously transporting the maize god to a specific place in the sky to be reborn. And Linda Sheely will tell you uh, everything here has astronomical connotations. And this is the famous uh, post Quetzalcoatl murals from Chichen Itza uh, from the Temple of the Warriors dated to 150 to 1200 CE. Here's the original and from 1931 and and Axtell Morris. And just to point out, this is a seacoast village. And we have three canoes here. We have lighter skinned canoers. Then we have darker skinned occupants of the canoes. And if you look, the occupants are carrying war shields. So this is strange to me that it shows up uh, at an inland site like Chichen Itza. So I'm wondering if this is the Chantol Maya uh, with some war canoes. And Columbus also recorded uh, sighting a canoe of Maya traders on his fourth voyage to the New World. His son Ferdinand wrote, there arrived at that time a canoe long as a galley and eight feet wide made of a single tree trunk like other Indian canoes. It was freighted with merchandise from the western regions around New Spain. Amidships that had a palm leaf awning, uh, like which the Venetian gondolas carry. This gave complete protection against the rain and waves. And under this awning were the children and women and all the baggage and merchandise. There were 25 paddlers. So here's an example of a Maya small canoe. These were used for local traffic. You could find these along the coast in Belize or high in the highlands of Lake Atitlan, all the same style carved out of one tree trunk. And uh, let's explore river and seagoing vessels with illustrations and renderings by Richard Thornton. Richard notes, in 2007, Florida researcher Douglas T. Peck contacted me to determine if it was provided, if I was provided sketches by Spanish explorers 
verbal descriptions by Spanish explorers and paintings and boats and canoes by Maya scribes working for the Spanish? Could I create three-dimensional renderings with architectural software, the types of boats and canoes constructed by the Chonto Maya? The answer was a definite yes, and it turned out to be extremely interesting professional activity for me, since until then I was totally unaware that many of the people in the Americas built canoes and boats with sawn wooden planks. So shortly thereafter, Doug determined that the indigenous people in southern Florida and coastal Georgia copied the small canoes and riverine freight canoes of the Mayas and carved them out of uh, massive tree trunks. And here we have some archaeological examples of Creek Indian boat pipes from Georgia, and they depict a type of Chanto Maya cargo boat and a it's a Maya canoe. So I was wondering who is Douglas T. Peck? And I found out that he's a, <laughs> a very special character. And he wrote a book uh, called The Origin and Diffusion of Maya Civilization, the Olmec Chontal Itza Centric Theater. Theater. This book differs from past publications related to the prehistoric Maya and that it was written as a chronological narrative history using William Dre's rational explanation philosophy rather than a highly technical treatise. Douglas. T. Peck is an iconoclastic seafarer, and he says, I can show where the Maya mastered celestial navigation a thousand years before the Europeans and spread their influence into Florida and beyond. He hoped to prove Mexico's pre-Columbian temple builders left enduring tracks scattered across the southeastern United States long before the Spanish state claim to the New World. When he passed in 2014, he left behind an unpublished book, Spanish La Florida, about the Maya connection to Florida, and a manuscript, Goddess Ischel, addressing Maya religion. So here we have uh, one of Richard Thornton's renderings, and this is of a canoe. Notice, again, the tall front and back. Uh, areas, and this is from the Umacinta River in Tabasco State, Mexico, and Piedras, Negras, the Ashilan are all along the river, and Bonampak is, is very near to the river. Mm. <clears throat> Here we have a canoe in the coastal marshes uh, near Moon River, Georgia, and these are canoes Beach at the Altamaha River in Georgia. And these are riverine canoes uh, on a statuary in Tuxla Mountains in Veracruz, Mexico. This is the lower, lower Olmec area. Now here we have a catamaran on Lake Okeechobee, Florida. And uh, Lake Okeechobee is only about 40 miles north of where I am here in South Florida. Notice a sail. This is very interesting. Um, and Lake Okeechobee. Well, one of the times when I met the Seminole chief, uh, James Billy, he told me that it's pronounced Lake Okeechobee because the Cho is like really wide. So it means really wide waters. Another interesting thing that James Billy told me, he asked me, why do you think the Maya have the little yellow crosses in the stitching in the beautiful men and women's shirts that they produce? <clears throat> and he told me that that's because the Seminoles in their oral history honored the fact that the Vikings made it as far down as Florida and the yellow crosses were to honor the Vikings arrival in Florida. This is a, a Chanto Maya town in the marshes of Tabasco. And look how the raised structures resemble the mound builders in the United States. The And here we have an example of mound builders. Look at this nice structure with the palm thatched roof structure on top of the mound. 
The Calusa, known as the Shell Indians, lived on the sandy shores of the southwest coast of Florida. Calusa means fierce people, and they were warlike people. The Calusa lived on top of high midden mounds, engineered canals, and water storage facilities, and they traded wild, widely while developing a complex and artistic society. And this area is due west of me, about 65 miles uh, near Fort Myers. And this area was hit by Hurricane Ian last year and uh, really devastated the coastal areas. But uh, the one island that still has some share, shell middens uh, visible, the shell middens survived. Here we have a Chonto Maya cargo boat on the Gulf Coast of Campeche State. And a sailed craft from the Chontal, which is the same size as a Viking longboat. And here we have a Chute or Chonto Maya war canoe uh, from Tampico Bay, Tamaulipas, Mexico. <coughs> Excuse me. So you may wonder where the uh, Chantal Maya are from. And this is on the Gulf Coast of Mexico in the state of Veracruz, east of the state of Campeche. And it consists of four municipalities, and the name refers to the state's Chontal Maya population, Chontalpa is also home to Tabasco's two main archaeological sites, La Venta, which is Olmec, and Comacalco, which is Maya. And here we have some more Chonto Maya canoes. Uh, they are Maya people from Tabasco. Chonto, from the Nahuatl word Chontali, which means foreigner, has been applied to various ethnic groups in Mexico. The Chantol refer them to themselves as the Yakotanab or the Yokotan, meaning the speakers of Yoko Ocho, Ochoco. They consider themselves the descendants of the Olmecs. And in the terminal classic period, the Chotan merchants controlled river and coastal trade in the Maya lowlands. So here's the coup de thought. This is a sailed seagoing vessel with a mast and sail and as david bowles points out uh the maya the yucatec maya had words for sail and to sail and the putun maya they were the buddies of the chonto the putun maya is a collective name for several groups of maya that displaced much of the older leadership of the maya lowlands during the late classic and post classic. The Putun, who came from the Gulf Coast in the northwest region of the Maya area, are generally held to have been more Mexicanized than their contemporaries. They were associated with the Puk architectural style and distinctive orangeware pottery. The Itza are often considered a group of Putun Maya, and the contemporary Chonto Maya of Tabasco speak a closely related language. Very interesting that they uh, infiltrated down in the Puk area and are associated with the Puk architectural style. And here is the paddle, preserved in a peat bog beneath the seafloor. The first ancient wooden canoe paddle was discovered during an underwater survey in Payne's Creek National Park in southern Belize in 2014 by Heather McKillop and her team from LSU. You notice it's the same style as I pointed out from the incised bones from Tikal used by the paddler gods. The antiquity of the Kaknab canoe paddle was verified by a radiocarbon date of 1300 plus or minus 40 years before present. Another interesting find by Heather McKillop and her team is a jadeite 
gouge. Uh, discovered at Ekwal Nal, Belize, the extremely high quality of this jadeite tool is particularly surprising, offering new insight into the classic Maya exchange systems and the role of the salt makers, such as those based at Ekwal Nal. And Heather McKillop has uh, written a book. I have it. It's really interesting. In Search of the Maya Sea Traders, uh, describes the trading port Wild Cane K, where exotic obsidian, jade, gold, and other goods, including highly crafted pots, meaning ceramics, were traded from distant lands. Heather also tells about the coastal inland trade of salt, seafood, and other marine resources. So what were they trading around the coast? On the Pacific coast, balsam, the wood, bark cloth, cotton, marine fauna like fish, stingray spines and shark teeth, shells, coral, salt, and cacao. On the Caribbean coast, sugar, honey, wax, tortoise shell, salt, marine fauna like fish, stingray spines, and shark teeth, shells, coral, cacao, and feathers. On the golf course, cacao, marine fauna like fish, stingray spines, and shark teeth, and tortoise shell. This is from Robert Scherer in uh, 2006. The extensive trade routes of the ancient Maya contributed largely to the success of their civilization spanning three millennia. So here's the names of many of the ports uh, along the Yucatan and Maya coast of Belize. Um, they fall into four primary categories, transshipment ports, autonomous ports, ports controlled by an inland polity, and departure ports. So we have Cerros, Chacbalam, Chacmol, El Meco, Isla Saritos, Isla Piedras, Ishpatun, Aina, the island, Laguna Francos, Marco Gonzalez, where Elizabeth Graham uh, goes for field seasons each year. We have Mogo Cay, San Hervasio, San Juan, Santa Rita, Tulum Tacan, Uaymil, Vista Alegre, where Dominic Riccio works, Wild K, K and Key, where Heather McKillop works, Ishkambo, Ishkaret, and Shelha. <coughs> Excuse me. So, using again satellite photography, I plotted all of the names of the, all of the sites of the names of the ports that I just uh, cited. And you'll find them all along the coast. And then when I showed this to uh, Lorraine Williams Beck, she said, well, there's a couple of the two main ports, Akanmul and Ulimal. And these would actually be located down over here. And Akunmal is 23 miles, kilometers east, south, east, northeast of Campeche City. And Ulumal is east, southeast of Champotum. They are both 16 kilometers inland from the coast. And they both have pre-Columbian docking features at the mouth of the river along which each is located. This is a really nice map. Uh, courtesy of David Bowles by Ralph L. Roys of the Carnegie Institution in Washington, 1957. And this is charting all the provinces in the Yucatan Peninsula at the time of the, uh, the Span arrival of the Spanish. Um, here's a couple. One of the rivers, Holtoon, where one of those sites I just mentioned is located. And Chapatoon is where the other site I just mentioned from Lorraine Williams Beck is located. And the interesting thing about this map is you can see three of the provinces 
have Chell in the names. And this is from the work of David Bowles. But there's Chikin Chell, Akin Chell, and Lakin Chell. And if you're familiar with the four directions of the Maya cosmology, Lakin means east and Chikin means west. And from searching the colonial sources, David has found out one could infer that the Cho family was involved in trade using the coastal waterways for their trade routes. And this was also the name of the local jaybird. Chell is the surname of a family of some importance, ranking, according to Diego de Alanda, with the Cocom and Xiu families as the most important families in Yucatan. Their name is incorporated into the name of three province, provinces, as I mentioned. Chiquin Chell, which means Western Chell, was located in the territory now known as Campeche. Akin Chell is located around the towns of uh, Zilam Gonzalez and Hotul Zilam, today Zilam Puerto or Zilam de Bravo. And they're centered around Progreso. And Locking Chell, meaning the Eastern Chell, is located along the inland waterway stretching from Hol Coven, today Rio Lagartos, to Hol Bax. And they're up along this region. And you can see how there is a inland waterway that is very much around most of the northern part of the Yucatan, down under here too, and in uh, along Belize, where there are outer stretches of land, and then there's the inland waterway, much like down here in South Florida, we have the hotels and everything along the coast and the beaches, but yet there's the inland waterway you got to cross to get over on these draw bridges that go over the inland waterway. And the inland waterways were where the uh, smaller canoes would move along and do their trading. So here we have the hidden coastal culture of the ancient Maya. And the Maya culture is often associated with farming and extraordinary inland cities full of fascinating architecture. But new research, however, shows that the people were also sophisticated mariners. And this illustration is by Mark Garrison. Vista Alegre, it's an island site. It's a ruin of a town near the northern tip of the Yucatan Peninsula. It was once a bustling outpost. Dozens of canoes crowded the harbor, loaded with dyes from the west, jade from the south, and obsidian from mountains hundreds of kilometers away. And the sound of trumpeting conch shells periodically sliced the air an alert from sentries scanning the horizon from platforms attached to the stone structures. The call signaled an incoming boat to trade or perhaps to plunder. Jeffrey Glover and his colleague Dominic Risolo have been exploring the small site for more than a decade. And the people came from all over, say Vera Tesler, says Vera Tesler of the Autonomous University of the Yucatan, there was a big melting pot of people there traveling down the coast. Glover and Risolo have expected a small town dependent on the fortunes of a much larger Chichen Itza, uh, sort of a nameless cog in the machinery of the great city only 125 kilometers away. But that's not what they found. Vista Alegre predates Chichen Itza by hundreds of years. And the people here ate differently, had different fashions, and traded an astounding diversity of precious things from around Mesoamerica. Again, using the uh, Ralph Roy's map, David Bowles cleaned it all up. And here he's showing all of the Sakbe from of the Maya. The blues are the port to site Sakbe's. And the greens are the site-to-site, uh, city-to-city, sock bays. <clears throat> I wonder if there was a, 
any kind of red lights here where the the sock bays intersect. You never you never hear of a, a sock bay intersection, <laughs> but the word sock bay translate to white road. But clearly, sock bay had layers of additional meanings to the Maya, as a mythological roots, pilgrimage pathways, trade routes, and concrete markers or political or symbolic connections between city centers and ports. Thank you, David, for this. So let's discuss why Azapa is where it's at. This is for you, Cheryl Norman. Why Azapa is where it's at. And this is a series of maps I put together from satellite photography. And here we have uh, Chiapas, the border with Guatemala. Here's Lake Atitlan down in Guana, highlands of Guatemala. And here's a Zappa <clears throat> over here. Along here runs the 14.8 degree latitude that Michael Grove mentioned Saturday in his program. Uh, it runs west to east, of course. And there's two major volcanoes, Takana, which is 4,093 meters high, and Tajamolco, the highest mountain in all of uh, Mesoamerica is up to 4,220 meters. Here's Ocos down here. Uh, the border runs up this way. Ocos is on the river that divides Guatemala from Mexico. I've, I've surfed there before. <laughs> and uh, Copan, this is what Michael Grove mentioned. The site of Copan lies directly to the east. It's on this same 14.8. <clears throat> and then it's interesting that the, the Quiche up in the highlands, their emperors would travel over to Copan to receive the, the white henband of rulership, the blessings to uh, you have your own family lineage started. But let's talk about the 260-day sacred calendar. And that's based uh, on the zenithal passages of the sun, August 13th and April 30th. These two dates are divided by periods of 260 days or 105 days. And it's the 260-day period in between the zenithal passages of the sun that they believe was the initial starting of the 260-day calendar. Uh, also, uh, the uh, southward passage of the sun over Soconosco is heralded by the Perseid meteor shower on the two preceding evenings. <clears throat> so, looking from Izapa, and aligning with the Tajamulco volcano, you can notice the helical rising of Venus on August 13th, 1359 BCE. And the Zoki priest who formulated the sacred calendar must surely have taken notice of this helical rising of Venus. Also, along the same alignment from Izapa to Tajamulco, you would notice the summer solstice sunrise on June 22nd. So here you have two of our main coordinates and the helical rising of Venus. And all together, these two lines of sight are going to come together here. And that's exactly where Izapa is located. And the internal structure of the 365-day secular calendar, the Hob calendar, more agricultural calendar, strongly suggests that it came into use during the period between 1324 and 1325 BCE, and that may be, in fact, have been the product of the same mind, the same individual who developed the sacred calendar just over 30 years earlier. And I want to point out also that there are uh, monuments at Izapa that have magnetic qualities. And there's a sculpture of a turtle's head that has a magnetic area. 
where you can put your compass down to it and and the compass will turn around in one direction and then move it a little bit the other way and the compass turns around the other direction. So this is the lower Soconusco coast, the upper Guatemalan Pacific coast, and it's exactly where some of the turtles would come to lay their eggs and exactly where the calendar started. <clears throat> I mentioned Vincent's Maelstrom earlier and uh, like 10 years ago, he said, but uh, he was taking his students down to the upper, uh, like Colombian, Ecuadorian region and looking for language uh, connections between this area and the South. So if we want to talk about the formative long date counts that are carved in stone, a long count combines the 260 day calendar with the Hob calendar. So the earliest one, uh, let's see. Um, the earliest month, 3237. So the earliest carved in stone long date is uh, 32 BCE. Oh no, Chiapa de Corzo, 36 BCE, four years difference. Um, carved on Stella II, at Torre Sapote, Stella C. And then we have further into the common area, the uh, La Moraja Stella, 143-156, a statuette in the Tuxla Mountains, 162. Takalika Bak has Stella V, uh, and another monument from 83 CE and 103 CE. And El Baul has Stella I, with a carved date of 37 CE. There's another date from a fragmented monument that may date to 39 BCE at Takalikabak. And these sites are all located along the same Pacific Coast trade route that comes down from the Olmec area across the Isthmus of Tehuatepec and down the Pacific coast. So let's talk about the postulated diffusion of the 260 day sacred calendar. So we start in 325 BCE. And uh, as Appa, I said, is in the area where scholars believe the calendar started. <clears throat> uh, 325 years later, in 1000 BCE, you can see it's moved to all of the sites along this major trade route. In the San Lorenzo, La Venta, Laguna, this is all Olmec area here. Here's Chapa de Corso, the Paseo de la Armada, uh, Abactacalic, and Caminahulio was a major site. It, it also showed, uh, this ties in with the the map I showed way earlier of the sites that have Olmec influence. And uh, 400 years later, it's moved further inland and further up into the highlands of Mexico. 300 BCE, it's further inland all along and further up into the highlands of Mexico. Uh, by zero, the year zero in the Gregorian calendar, it's included in some of the Maya <clears throat> sites. And then Il Mirador was 300 CE of the Common Era. This is all very interesting how it started in one place and then spread everywhere else. Getting to uh, Tikal and Nakbe. Uh, 300 years later in uh, 600 CE. Well, we finally made it to Cacao and Jay. And Cacao has, from very early on, especially from when Cacao was taken uh, over to Europe uh, in the 15, 1600s, there's been a lot of our artists illustrating Cacao uh, showing up in the botanical books. 
And this is an interesting map I created, again, using satellite photography. And it shows the dispersal of cacao from its origins in the Amazon basin around 3300 BCE and coming up through the Americas. Uh, probably by the specific trade route, it made it up to Paso de la Amada by 1900 BCE over into the Olmec area 100 years later, around 1800 BCE, uh, over to the Alua Valley of Honduras, 1150 BCE, and all the way up into the U.S. Southwest by 1000 to 1125 CE. And I thank uh, Mary Pohl, who shared with me an email exchange between Rosemary Joyce and John Henderson, who worked for decades in the Alua Valley. And uh, they were questioning a 1900 BCE date that Mary Lou Rodinger originally had in her program about cacao and jade. <clears throat> and uh, he said, no, actually what shows up in the archeological excavations in ceramics uh, is 1150 BCE. And this area here of the Zoconosco coast is where the Mokaya people, they were translated to the people of corn. And they were the first to cultivate cacao in the initial formative period during the Bara phase of ceramics, 1800 to 1400 BCE. So here is a a map showing the uh, evolution of the domestication of cacao. And these four sites here with the different shapes are the four earliest sites where archeological evidence uh, was found with cacao uh, theobromine residue in the ceramics. And it uh, as well as shows the species diversity in distributions for the genus Theobroma, and by at least 5,300 calendar years before present, the uh, the Mayo Chinchipe people were using wild species of the same type as domesticated cacao. And this paper is named Geographic and Genetic Population Differentiation of the Amazonian Chocolate Tree. And the analysis of the genetic substructure within the clusters, these are various clusters, provides some clues to the origin of the national cultivar, which finally makes its appearance over here on the Pacific coast. The national groups, individual clusters from the Amazon side of the Andes. However, these individuals are not included in the national subcluster. This probably reflects centuries of human selection in the Ecuadorian coast, Pacific side of the Andes, and the black lines show the location of Amazon ancient ridges, paleo arches, mountains that the various original subgroups would have needed to cross. And you can see it, it crosses a ridge and uh, turns into a different sub-variety and as it gets over the next ridge, over the next ridge. And then these yellow circles, that's the Mesoamerican type of cacao, and it's the Criollo. So uh, working with John Henderson, uh, the paper by he and Rosemary Joyce, Gretchen Haar, and Jeffrey Hurst, along with Patrick McGovern, that they prepared a uh, for the proceedings in the National Academy of Science, paper named Chemical and Archaeological Evidence for the Earliest Cacao Beverages. And here is showing the use of cacao at Puerto Esmonil, Honduras. So Puerto is port, so they would have been coming up the rivers here uh, and taking cacao to Puerto Escondido. It shows that cacao beverages were being there before 1100 BCE. 
in Puerto Escondido is a small but wealthy village in the lower Rio Ulua Valley. These are a couple of Barranca brown bottles from uh, northern Honduras, this one on this side. The vessels were designed for pouring and drinking liquids, marking Puerto Escondido's participation in the interaction sphere that embraced much of Mesoamerica in the late, early formative period. Over here on the left, we have a bodega brown bottle from northern Honduras, which is closely related to the types of vessels used for liquids along the Pacific coast. And the only known use of native South American uses of Thibroma cacao either employ the fruity pulp surrounding the seeds as a refreshing source of liquid, or they fermented it to produce chicha, an alcoholic beverage often made from maize and manioc. But the cultivation, domestication, and chocolate processing were Mesoamerican innovations where they also fermented cacao chichas. The Maya had a god of cacao, Akuak. And a lot of images of cacao and maize show up in the polychrome ceramics in the Maya based database of Justin Kerr. And this is a palacine with a cacao tree. The individual using the matate down here is probably grinding the cacao pods into a powder or paste. Iconographic images from the classic period ceramics and stoneware reveal a significant and continuing connection between cacao and maize. Here's an illustration of that very same vase and uh, the palacine with cacao tree. Mary Miller and Simon Martin have suggested that the intimate iconographic relationship between cacao and maize reflects their importance within Maya cultures, and that the cacao may be associated with the transformation and rebirth of the maize god. And here's another polychrome vase. After his beheading, the lords of by the lords of the other world, Hun Hunupul's head is hung on a cacao tree. Mary Miller and Simon Martin have proposed that the maize god may also be a deity of cacao. And here's Hun Hunapu up uh, with his head turning into a uh, cacao flower up here in this upper register. Here are some other images. The classic Maya maize god depicted as a cacao tree carved on a bowl. His name, Ishimpe, or maize tree, appears in the vertical panel over here. And this is courtesy of Michael Cole. Another view of the maize god where he's pointing to an open codex down here, naming the human protagonist as the maize tree. It's from an unprovenant stone bowl and the drawing is by Simon Martin. Here on the side of the Pakal, the great sarcophagus, the Palenque, we find his mother, Lady Sakuk, uh, with cacao pods on a tree. Here's a ceramic vessel of a monkey holding a cacao pod, and it's got hieroglyphic text here. Another view of the polychrome vase, a ruler is speaking to a kneeling attendant with a vessel of frothy cacao and a tripod vessel of tamales. El Chua appears as a Maya merchant with a cacao tree in this colorful mural at Cacaxla, Mexico. Chocolado, cacao in the Codex Nuevo.
And cacao was one of the ASEC's most widely traded products. Here's some images from the codices. And uh, here's an illustration that for 30 cacao beans, you could exchange it for one small rabbit. So if you got tired of drinking, you could eat some meat. Here's a tribute list uh, that shows that they were demanding, the Aztecs were demanding tribute from those they conquered of jade, quetzal feathers, other bird feathers, jaguar skins, and cacao. And uh, they say Moctezuma was pretty much addicted to drinking cow, sometimes as much as 40 or 50 cups a day. And here is a, a painting of his meeting with Cortez, where Moctezuma's assistants uh, shared cacao. But Cortez says, uh, yeah, this is nice, but show me the gold, show me the gold. And from a glyph by Michael Groth, we have the uh, syllabic uh, version of the cacao glyph. And we can see this, this fish-like fin is ka, ka, ow, ow. So we have cacao. And Michael Groth, uh, he made me... He may have moved on from the University of California at Davis now, but uh, he had a paper in a presentation, The Recipe for Rebirth, Cacao is Fish in the Mythology and Symbolism of the Ancient Maya. There's another version of that glyph. And Michael says, I believe that it is important to honor the specialness of chocolate by protecting the forest from which it comes respecting the farmers who cultivate it, and learning about the past and present Maya who have given the world this true gift. Thank you, Michael, who's a chocolatier himself. And here, once again, in, is that illustration of Hun Hunapun transforming into a cow pod uh, by Michael. That comes from the vase I showed earlier, K5615 from Justin Kerr's work. And Carl Talby has proposed that the maize god is equivalent to Hun Hunapu in the Popal Vu, whose death and rebirth represent the agrarian cycle of planting and harvesting maize. The first chemical evidence of cacao came about 15 years ago after the analysis of residue from a vessel found in Rio Azul in northeastern Guatemala and belonging to the early classic, approximately 460 CE. Here is a ceramic bowl depicting the maize god as a personified cacao tree. I think we saw the illustration of this early, earlier. And this is a sensor lid showing a woman with cacao from the south coast of Guatemala. And these are ceramic vessels that were tested and showed evidence of theobromine uh, from San Lorenzo in the Olmec area. And here's a fragment of ceramic vessel used for cacao from Paso de la Amada. This is way, way back, one of the earliest examples that we have of, of cacao. A painted tripod vessel from the Paten of Guatemala, also used for serving cacao, and a lidded tripod vessel with hieroglyphs from the central Paten. And here's an illustration by Benedetto Cristiani, Cristani, uh, BYU. And here we have Richard Terry, Terry. Richard gave a program for the Institute of My Studies earlier this year about his uh, research. And together with researchers at Brigham Young University, including Professor 
Emeritus, uh, Richard Terry and graduate students Bryce Brown and Christopher Balzotti, they've identified new locations where the Maya grew cacao. And that is in the um, sinkholes and dryer sonotes of, uh, of the Yucatan. And here's um, Christopher Balzotti climbing an ancient staircase discovered in a sinkhole. Also, here's a picture, a recent picture of a cacao pod picked from a tree growing in the sinkhole. This is La Inyom at Cobal, Coba in the Yucatan. And cacao trees were grown in the shade of the taller trees uh, in the sinkholes. So for families that own the sonotes, the cultivation of cacao in their groves represented their upper socioeconomic status. And here for you, Cheryl Norman, is cacao growing at the site of Azapa. And what's really what's really interesting is uh, back in 2010, uh, in preparation for the 2012 festivities, we were part of the group on the behalf of the Maya Conservancy who took 13 Maya elders uh, led by uh, Tat Rigoberto at Sep Chan Chavac of uh, Momostanango in the highlands of Guatemala. We took them into Mexico. Izapa is only about 15 kilometers, 15 miles inside of the border, but it took a year and a half to get the Maya visas. And uh, we did it on private land right at the end of the ball court in Group F. And we walked to their cacao grove. So I picked two pods to put on the mesa, the offering for the ceremony. And Tat Rigoberto came over to me and he says, Jim, what are these? And I said, they are cacao pods. And even though during his annual Expo Maya, where he teaches uh, the Maya school children, a lot of other people, um, they use cacao beans as sort of a money, an entrance token. And you give your cacao bean and then you walk through this like long tunnel and then you come into the rooms with all the displays and information. And But Tat Rigoberto has never seen a cacao pod growing, uh, which was... Uh, <laughs> eye-opening to me. <laughs> so now let's enter the realm of the world of Jadeite. And Jadeite in the Americas is located in the mountains, the Sierra de las Minas, on the, uh, the Bay Caribbean coast, of uh, Guatemala, and there are two plates, the North American plate and the Caribbean plate uh, that are subsurfacing each other. And this is where the temperatures get high enough that jadeite and neophyte can be formed. And here's that sub subduction zone you can see how the jade is created. And this is the, the Paleo Motagua Fault Zone. And there's a Maya block going under the southern block. So right here is where you find the jade. And Mary Lou and Jay Riding were, were instrumental in being the first to rediscover the mines, the sources for jadeite uh, used and distributed by the ancient Maya. Uh, and it, they first discovered it along the Motawa River from uh, big boulders that had over time rolled down uh, from the mountains into the river. And she said they could walk around with uh, heavy hammers and you could hit the, the big rocks. And if there was a certain ping 
then even though the outer appearance may not have appeared to be Jedi at all, that certain sound was what told you it was uh, Jade. And here are the two rivers in that fault zone area, right where uh, Livingston, Puerto Barrios, uh, on the Guatemalan Caribbean coast, uh, exit into the water. And here are some beautiful examples of Maya jade from all over the Maya lands. Also, the Maya used jade for adornment, especially uh, the royals putting uh, little jade. must have been very uh, painful to have jade put into your teeth, but it was uh, an adornment of distinction. And this is the biggest piece of card jade they have found yet. It's at Altunha in Belize, 14 pounds, and it represents uh, the solo lord Ganesha Hau. This is a jade headdress piece for in the form of the jester god or Kawil. and a jade mask from Rio Azul. And if you're ever in Antigua, Guatemala, uh, Mary Lou Rattinger still has, uh, still is working nine of the 11 mines that they had. And there's a cottage industry of having uh, Maya, a lot of the Maya workers who have uh, rediscovered the ancient jade carving techniques and they do not only replicas of artifacts that have been found but all the different little mementos also that you can you can buy smaller pieces of jade the omex preferred the blue green jade and it is interesting that hurricane mitch our Brothers in the sky seeded the clouds and uh, way off the coast of Honduras. And over a few days' time, it made the hurricane stall over the coast of Honduras, caused a lot of damage, floods, landslides, a lot of deaths. Uh, but it revealed the source of the blue green jade. And I forget if I've mentioned it before, but the Maya controlled the green jade that was precious to them on the north side of the Motagua River. There were other tribes on the south side of the river who controlled the blue-green jade. And somehow those people were able to get the blue-green jade all the way up around the Yucatan Peninsula and over to the Olmec areas without the Maya knowing. Another polychrome vase, 4339 from Justin Kerr, and we see an offering of jade to its amna. Here are the hero twins from the Popal Vu are dressed in jade bead attire from K. 1183. And here's some of the blue green jade that was traded down across the isthmus of Tuatepec along the Pacific coastal route south to the site of Takalikabak. And right here is a carving that Linda Sheely did of a jade tree. Uh, this is carved in jade. And you can see it at the little museum that Mary Lou Ridinger maintains at her Jade Maya. Some other examples of jade from the tombs. We have Pakal the Great, all the jade that he wore, his jade mask. Uh, here is a ceramic vase from tomb 196 at Tikal that uh, 
tested positive for theobromine. Uh, this tomb 196 was discovered by Nicholas Helmuth. Also, tomb 190 at Tikal had an abundance of jade and spondylus. And here's a, uh, a jade monkey from the tomb of Kenich Yashkuk at Kupal. Kupan. Here's more jade. This is, uh, again, jade found in C2 in Burial 196 by Nicholas Helmuth and his team. And 1963. And these images of jade are from his Harvard thesis. Another example of jade uh, found in a tomb. This time it's of a warrior queen in El Peru, Waka, around uh, dated to around 700 to 750 CE. It was all discovered by David Lee and his team. So a lot of the blue-green jade went a lot further down the Pacific Coast trade route from uh, the Olmec area all the way to Costa Rica. And these samples, this is very Olmec-like, uh, show up in the Museum Le Jade in San Jose. And we've reached the end of the show, but I thought I would show you all this. <laughs> this is a statue of Oscar Wilde in Marion Square in Dublin. And the sculpture statue was by created by sculptor Danny Osborne. And he used Guatemalan jadeite to carve the head and the hands of Oscar Wilde. So with that, I bring this program to an end and I thank you, thank you, thank you if you have made it this far into the program and are here with me still. And uh, it's really been a pleasure producing this whole production, hours and hours, months and months of uh, creating maps and putting this all together. But I truly hope that uh, you've been exposed to some new information that will give you some food for thought about all the early connections between various North and South American uh, cultures, uh, the Polynesians, the Caribbean. It all happened so very early. And a lot of the gen genetic studies are just revealing it. So it is totally interesting to me and I hope it has been to you also. Thanks so much for viewing. Thank you very much for viewing this video. And please subscribe to our At Slender YouTube channel. To subscribe to free monthly issues of the At Slender Magazine of the Americas, contact your host, Jim Reed, at mayaman at bellsouth.net. Do it. Thanks again.